Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. And I'm joined this week by regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, who's one of three reps from the town of Brattleboro. Hello, Emily. Hi, Olga. So nice to see you today. So nice to see you too. And just for the sake of listeners, um, I'm at my cousin's house and the best place to record is actually on their screened in porch. So you may hear the birds and the chipmunks waking up this morning. So nice, nice um, accompaniment to our talk about the post-primary um, election I, or election, the primaries. Um, I don't know about you, Emily, but I just, I've been away for a little while, so I just checked my mailbox, Mm. and oh my goodness, (laughs) I just, three quarters of my mailbox was just like. I don't know if, um, I don't know if somehow like all the camp, I don't know if I went into the voter database and removed myself at some point, and I don't remember doing that, or if like the political database because I could have mm-hmm. done that if I wanted to, or mm-hmm. if just like I got shunted into some magical category, but I have not gotten phone banked, texted, and I've really received a minimum of mail um, compared to everyone else I know. But I was... Um, were you sad that you were left no, out? No, 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 no. I don't feel left out at all. Um, I, you know, I have many opportunities, especially through this show to talk to the candidates. Um, and that is enough for me to do my own research. Um, but it's been interesting. It was interesting. I did some um, phone banking and knocking on doors for Becca's campaign um, mm-hmm. in the weekend before um, the election and, you know, a lot of people, and even actually before that. So lots of people have been talking to me about the mail. So many people have talked to me about the mail and I, people have shown me their stacks of mail. Someone brought their stack of mail to the poll. I saw someone like post on Twitter, like I'm bringing my mail. Can I exchange it for a new Congresswoman? (laughs) (laughs) It does kind of feel like, I don't know if you remember the days, but my mom and grandmother used to collect green what are they called? Green stamps, green mm-hmm. seal stamps. That's green kind of stamps, what it felt yeah. like, green stamps. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I also, I'm going to take this opportunity for a public service announcement because I had a bunch of friends text me and say like, can you please get me off this list? <laughs> um, and I just, especially in the congressional campaign, the whole idea of an uncoordinated pack, there's was sort of some coverage of coordinated and uncoordinated packs. And so Mm -hmm. I just want to be clear, the whole deal with an uncoordinated pack, which is what most congressional, which is what most campaign finance laws require for most big spending Mm -hmm. is that they can't coordinate. That's what that means. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Uh-huh. Like uncoordinated actually means not coordinating. And so there's no way to tell them to stop like, sending mail to Becca's next door neighbor because they already know Becca, you know, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's, that's the deal with an uncoordinated campaign. And that's why, you know, five pieces of mail might arrive on the same day because it's uncoordinated campaign. I imagine that there's probably more efficient ways to reform election finance law mm-hmm. and campaign law so that maybe such a silly thing, um, could be fixed or could not happen or whatever it is. But, um, well, I that think, is a yeah. good public service announcement because mm-hmm. it seems to me, um, and of course, I never know sometimes, um, my, my work as a journalist sometimes puts me on more lists than perhaps I may have ended up on um, as a non-professional. Mm-hmm. So sometimes when I get all this, these letter, this mail, I'm like, is everybody getting this or is this just... Um, Am I just getting extra because they're trying to, you know, they want the media coverage. And I would think, Olga, actually, that um, you might even get less because in the metrics, you would not be considered a strong D or a strong R. That's true. And a lot of the someone who's really tailoring their mail because they don't have 
all the money in the world might only send to sort of strong members of either party. So you might even be getting less now than other people. I don't know. Well, now I feel very sorry for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, let's like back up a little bit and talk about something other than the mail because a lot yes. happened on Tuesday and the mail is the least of it. Yes. And before we dive in, I do just want to uh, do the disclaimer. Yes. That I went on the Secretary of State's office um, website this morning, and we're pre recording this on Thursday, the 12th, no, the Friday, the Friday morning, sorry. Um, so as of now, as of 7 31 on Friday morning, um, the, the results are still unofficial. So I just, the reporter in me needs to put that disclaimer out there. I'm not expecting any major changes, but we are talking about unofficial results at this point. We are. Yes. So as a lawmaker who yeah. you, you were running unopposed in your primary. Um, I was. Now that the dust is starting to settle and, and you're thinking about who you might be working with in the new uh, legislative session, mm-hmm. Kind of what are you sitting with right now? Oof. Um, it's so not the question I thought we were going to start with here. Let's see. What am I? I'm like still like resting from like the frenzy of election season. Um, there's a lot of young candidates. There's a lot more mothers. Mm-hmm. Um, mothers who are actively parenting children at home. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think there's always been a lot of mothers in the, I mean, not always, but for the last few years, there's been a lot of mothers in the state house. Um, So there's a lot more folk, there's a lot more younger folks than folks with kids at home. Um, I think the Senate especially has gone a little bit younger than it had historically, which is not, you know, a very difficult feat to do given (laughs) what the age composition over there is. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's really exciting. The house is very much um, feels like a lot of the new candidates we got are emerge alum um, or folks who have been super active in their community, sort of like hustling and bustling and organizing. And that's so that feels really, really exciting to have a lot of new candidates who are ready to sort of hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. The with the leadership of the committee is changing um, and likely still having the same speaker of the house. Um, it feels like a real time for us to like update old myths um, Mm -hmm. and change some of our thinking on how we get things done. That feels like very, very, a lot feels possible now. Simultaneously, the Senate really um, stuck with their incumbents, Mm -hmm. the Senate races. So even though there was a lot of Senate races that were open and had like pretty highly competitive candidates in them, the Washington County Senate race for one. Mm -hmm. Um, The incumbents still placed, sort of um, placed in all of those races. And so the Senate's not gonna have as much of a shakeup as might have happened otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that's, I I wanna go back to what you said about um, the possibilities around getting things done Can you give us an example of what you're kind of thinking about? Um, So, and I think it's important to remember also, we're gonna have the, I think the biggest new class of legislators ever, I could be wrong. Um, Wow. But also all these changes in chairs and chairs sort of set the tone for things. Mm -hmm. And then the legislators that came in last biennium, they were only in the state house for less than a, they weren't even in the state house for a whole session. Mm -hmm. And so they're all still sort of finding their footing in a way that's a little bit different from past legislatures. Um, They're still a little more open to process and um, opportunity. And so one just like very concrete example of this is that when Shumlin's single payer healthcare reform happened, my Mm -hmm. camera is in a different place on my computer today. And it's like, I like don't know Isn't where my eyes should go. Out? <laughs> I don't know where my eyes should go and it's really freaking me out. So I'm sorry for anyone who's watching this on um, video. I'm doing the best I can here. Um, 
I even moved you over next to the camera, Olga, so I could talk to you, but it's not Thank it doesn't you. Seem to be working. Yes. No, it does. Um, it feels like you're talking to me. Oh, good. Good, good. I'm glad. Okay. <laughs> so um, when the single payer essentially failed under Shumlin, um, there was a lot of people who had a lot of hope and then that hope was dashed. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of, and the folks who sort of experienced that dashing of hope weren't interested for the most part in trying again. Right, right. Um, that was quite a while ago in terms of changes in the economy, changes in healthcare mm-hmm. in America, changes in health insurance rates, changes in health insurance coverage. We're really in like a totally different chapter of that story. But if the majority of legislators in power, especially say the chair of the healthcare committee were there for that, they're gonna be sort of thicker in that memory of it not working than mm-hmm. new folks coming in with hope and promise. Most legislators come in after knocking on doors right. with that being their number one issue. And then no one wants to do anything that's about true. it who is sort of holding the reins of agendas. And so that's that's a, that's funny a disconnect. That's a disconnect. Um, similarly, you know, we got really, really, really far on family medical leave four years ago and didn't get that passed. Um, three years ago, before the COVID, two biennium ago, <laughs> biennia, two anyway, um, and didn't get that passed. But there are enough new people now who see what would have COVID would have been like with it. You know, all of that that sort of that that failure memory um, isn't as sticky. Mm-hmm. That was just sort of, that's kind of the examples I'm thinking of. Okay, great, thank you. Uh-huh. Um. Were there any races that you were kind of keeping an eye on? I know there are races I was keeping an eye on. How about you? Um, Well, you know, Becca Balance Congressional Campaign is like where all of my heart and soul and love sit. My hope for Mm -hmm. the future. Unbelievably thrilled with that win and what it means about Vermont and what Vermonters want and what Vermonters believe in. And maybe we should spend like a whole section on deconstructing that campaign. Um, but there are also some littler races that I was really interested in around the state. And I just want to name sort of two that I was really interested in. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sharon Thetford, which is in Orange County, had an open primary. It's three people competing for two seats. One Mm -hmm. of them, Jim Maslin, has been in the legislature for a really long time. He serves on Ways and Means with me and has forever. Um, and then there was two other candidates. And one of them's Rebecca Holcomb, who is the former um, education, sec- secretary. education secretary. I was trying to remember if it was commissioner or secretary. She was the secretary of the Agency of Education. Um, and then the other person in the race was um, select board, school board, local community involved, both women around the same age, both sort of parenting in the community, that kind of thing. What was really interesting to me about this district is that Rebecca Holcomb is vehemently, publicly, Twitter fully um, opposed to any public money going to private education in Vermont. Mm -hmm. She's probably the loudest voice on this issue in Vermont. And Vermont has, you know, a 200 year history of sending public money to private schools. Mm -hmm. Um, And which is like, not that consequential if say this was a conversation happening in Brattleboro, but the community that this happened in hosts two of the five maybe historic academies in the state of Vermont. Um, And the historic academies are essentially private schools that have served as the public schools for their community since those communities started having schools. Mm -hmm. So St. John's Barry Academy is another one. Um, Burr and Burton is another one. And the other candidate in the race was someone who served on the board of one of those academies. And so it became this, to me, from way from the outside, it was this fascinating proxy battle about this idea of sort of private money for education versus public, you know, um, public money for private education or not Mm -hmm. in a community that that's how they educate their kids. Right. And so even though everyone thought Rebecca Holcomb was like the sure win on that 
race, Mm -hmm. I wondered if things would play out very differently on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they didn't. Uh And that's also like she won. And so that's really interesting to me. And I'm looking forward to like unpacking that a lot more with folks who live around there. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, one of the questions I would have for the local community in in that case is, you know, if if education has been run in these communities that way with this historic these historic academies for so long, part of me would wonder how many people understand the difference or some of the not the difference, but the nuance Mm -hmm. of how that funding is happening. And um, yeah. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Or if even like that came up, was able to come up in the race because people, maybe people were talking about other issues and just didn't even realize this difference. Like that. So I'm very interested in that one. Um, the other one I'm interested in is, as we know, it's very, very hard to unseat an incumbent in Vermont. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Mike Yantachka, who's a rep from Charlotte, okay. um, who is sort of in a lot of ways, like standard, keep your head down, older white man, Democrat, um, you know, Mm -hmm. sort of votes with the party most of the time, um, fairly active on environmental issues. Voted against Prop 5 on the second round of voting. Um, That's that's why that name sounds familiar. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Um, And... It was somewhat last minute, his vote against it, or at least he didn't warn anyone that he was voting against it. Um, and had, was challenged by someone who thought that was really just totally unacceptable. I'm with her. I think that was unacceptable. Um, and she won. Mm-hmm. And Mike's not coming back. Wow. Yeah. And wow. so that's another place where it's easy to sort of tell the story like that's all that anyone was voting on was, Mm -hmm. you know, just abortion rights or reproductive freedom rights, but also, you know, what motivates someone to come out and run, which was this Prop 5 vote, it might just be that the community was ready for some change and they were excited from the new energy and maybe she knocked more doors or like had a more compelling story or all those things. So the outside, it's just sort of like, you know, I'm thinking a lot about sort of the inside story and the outside story of these races and looking forward to understanding them more. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting point, because while we always see the outcome of a vote, we don't necessarily have any insight into what was going through individual voters' minds yeah. when they ticked one box over another mm-hmm. um, and, and what they were evaluating. So, so that is, I like that inside-outside story. Yeah. Now, we should just touch quickly on um because this section is going fast we should touch quickly on just the fact that um you know here we are holding this show and you are technically in a race for um election what you know one of the a few of the things i sat with as a journalist was you know how are you getting like quote unquote earned media time Mm -hmm. that maybe other people aren't getting because you are a regular contributor to this podcast. Um, And I think you and I tried very hard to make sure we had some firewalls in place around some of the candidate interviews we did and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, one of the conversations that we hear a lot about, especially for folks who are new is who gets a voice. Mm-hmm. You know, and who gets to step up to the podium and get the most face time with voters, um, whether it's through traditional media or through like their own social media or whatever. Um, did you get a chance to kind of sit with that at all as someone who's in a, a race yourself? Yeah, it's interesting. I've been, um, you know, in addition to this show and the four years we've been doing this for just about yeah um I organized these events on the town common that I've told you about um Mm -hmm. where I invited candidates from across the political spectrum to come to the common and talk to voters um and really thought of that as a service 
to my constituents to figure out who they wanted to vote for. Um, and that felt in some ways similar to this show mm -hmm. in that, you know, the first time I ran, I remember knocking on someone's door and they said, I'm a Republican, so I don't know if you want to, you know, like bother with me here. And I was like, well, if I win, I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to serve you. Like I'll be mm -hmm. your legislator. So might as well like know what you want and dream and yep. like, and you know, might as well get to know each other. Um, and for me, it's like that real constant shifting between what it means to be a public servant and what it means to be a politician. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think I have the privilege here in Wyndham County in Brattleboro in the context of sort of incumbent safety, um, a really sort of strong democratic left progressive left majority um that i can really sit in this public servant hat most of the time in these conversations we have where it's about just like having people understand issues um i have my personal thoughts on them they very they often don't feel partisan and i feel like when i'm like getting just like straight up partisan i name it on the show um I think, yeah, for the most part, yes, you do. Yeah, for the most yeah. part. Um, but it's an interesting, you know, and on election day, I had all of the campaign signs of all of the candidates that had come to the Wyndham County Action Network, like to those um, things on the common with me. And I just set them all up on the polls. Like I put one of Joe Benning's lawn signs up at the polls because mm -hmm. um, I thought maybe he wouldn't be able to make it down. And I thought voters deserve to sort of, you know, see their options. I, but what we've been able to build here, mm -hmm. you and I over these four years, Olga, is at this point, a tremendous amount of access and voice. You know, mm -hmm. we started it, you know, anyone could have just been like, hey, person with a radio show, do you want to do this thing with right. me? You know? Um, but sort of like what we've built now definitely gives me like sort of a lot of incumbency power. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot mm -hmm. more people listen to this now than did four years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of what's been interesting to me about some of these races. Um, I, so I like, I would love to talk about Isaac and Shanae's races in a minute and what they mean about like, um, who has access and who doesn't because I have mm -hmm. I think there's sort of a story being told about that and I think there's another story that could be available that's sort of related mm -hmm. to a radio show so I'm going to hold that off to see if what are your, what are your thoughts on sort of the partisanness of the of us doing this together during election season I also want to say just for the record I got more Republican write-in votes than any other candidate congratulations thank you wow <laughs> I didn't get enough to automatically get the nomination. And so I don't think they're going to give me the nomination, but I did get more than anyone else. Um, that I, I love that you said that because to me, that sums up um, Vermont politics in so many ways that um, we don't always stay to party lines the way other, other areas of the country do. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's interesting when Thanks for asking that question. When we started this show, I sat a lot with this question because traditionally, and I think for very good reasons, there's much more of a, um, a, a canyon or a firewall or a, you know, a brick mm -hmm. wall between um, politicians and, and the press. And I think that's, that's a very good, a very good um, thing in general. I do feel in a small state like Vermont, that's sometimes harder because everybody mm -hmm. wears multiple hats all the time. So, but I did sit with that a lot and I had to be okay with it because I knew I was going to get pushback, especially from other reporters. And I did, I did. I had, I had some reporters say, wow, you're just a dirty journalist now, aren't you? Um, and kind of got really insulting about it. 
but um, where I came to a point where I was okay with it is two things. One, I've always felt you're someone who I could say, Emily, I don't like where this is going. Or there's been a few conversations we've had about guests mm-hmm. where, where I, I have said, you know what, they're to they're just talking party lines or they're not Mm -hmm. staying true to the show. Um, And, and so I appreciate that about our working relationship. The other thing it came down to is I felt at the time, no one was kind of coming at policy from the direction that we were coming at Mm -hmm. it from. And I just felt that that was, again, I think I put on my public service hat and I said, I, I want this to, to serve people in a way that I Mm -hmm. feel other um, areas aren't right now. Um, But I do still sit with regularly, like Emily as politician, like, how are we, how are we putting you out in the world? Mm -hmm. And, and is it doing justice to the, so I still sit with that. I think that's kind of, for me, a moving target, if that makes sense. It does. And I think we've been able to go deeper on the conversations we've had because of the strength of our relationship through Mm -hmm. this. And I don't think that often happens because of sort of journalist firewalls Um, and politician firewalls. I mean, I, the degree to which my colleagues are terrified to talk to journalists without like having all of their lines memorized in advance, I think is a real detriment to good journalism. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I also have this really funny experience at, um, Becca's election night party. So I was the host of the party and I am doing um, along with Craig Miskovich. And so I'm running around, you know, like I'm there, you know, hours before the candidate or even the campaign team is going to come. I'm setting everything up and I'm, you know, because it was like across a few spaces in downtown Brattleboro and all of these journalists start pouring in, Um, including all these journalists that I like work with in Montpelier that are like very Burlington, Montpelier, Nexus space. I've never seen them down here. I just, like, like, did you so, get lost? <laughs> no, and like a few of them, like once <laughs> at one point, Peter Hirschfeld is like power walking across the courtyard into a building. And I'm like, Pete, do you know where you're going? Like, he doesn't even say hi to me. And I'm like, Pete, do you know where you're going? And he turns around, and he's like, no. I'm like, because you want to go over there. <laughs> and but what happened is like, I feel like just these colleagues, like they're my colleagues, right? You know, like we were in the thick of the work together. And they're in my hometown and I'm like so excited to host them and they like can't even take a drink from me, you know, um, at the party. And that just felt like such a sad aspect of, and I'm like excessively hosty oriented. So I realized that this might not be like a major loss in the world to other people. Um, (laughs) But that part of it was really sort of, that was an interesting part of the whole dynamic to me. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we've reached a point with the other thing I find interesting about this conversation right now is I think in our, our media landscape, we have reached a point where there are so, so many soapboxes mm-hmm. and very narrow soapboxes that people speak from, whether they're a journalist or a politician or, or what have you, that um, even when people are trying to be neutral, mm-hmm. um, it, it doesn't come across that way. Someone's like, well, of, where's the agenda? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's kind of sad because I, you know, it, it goes to the point of, I think it speaks to the lack of trust that a, a lot of people have in institutions like media, like government. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I really appreciate how you've sort of slowly brought a little more and more of your personal self into the show over the years um, that like you have lived experiences journalists or not and they Mm -hmm. do inform how you think about these issues thank you i Mm -hmm. appreciate that emily um on that note we actually Mm -hmm. have to go to break so we can hear from some underwriters so stay tuned folks the montpelier happy hour will return on wvw 107.7 lp brattleboro in a moment Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you're just joining us, I am your host, Olga Peters. I am speaking with regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, and we're hashing out the 
Vermont primary that happened on the 9th of August. So, and we're still talking about unofficial results, just, just to be clear. Um, Emily, what do we need to remind folks of? The views and opinions, Olga, that are expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour, meaning yours and mine today, are those of just ours, yours and mine, separately from each other, <laughs> not our employers, not the radio station, not the TV station, not the computer that you are streaming this from, just the two of us and our views and opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank also, you for that public service announcement. That was a particularly scrambly one. Um, I think we always do this election debrief with John Walters and we just didn't this week. And I almost texted him at like 11 o'clock last night and didn't because that seemed ridiculous. Um, so sorry, John. I don't know if you actually listen to the podcast when you're not on it, but we'll, we'll get you back in soon. Yes. Yes. I, I was thinking this morning, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Where's John? And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> no one invited him. <laughs> we forgot to do this. It's been a week. Um, <laughs> Uh, so before the break, you had brought up a race um, between um, Isaac Evans Franz and, um, oh my gosh, I, my brain just. So they weren't off. running against each other. They're just two comments in the race. So okay. Isaac, I'll, I'll let you skip that transit, that intro and just say this stuff. So, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So Isaac Evans Franz um, lives in Brattleboro in West Brattleboro, like right down the dirt road for me. Um, mm hmm and was running against Peter Welch in the Democratic yes. primary. And Shanae Clifford, um, actually don't know where she lives. I know it's further, way further north of here, um, was running in the congressional race with Becca and Molly Gray and that Lewis, I don't even remember what the guy's name is, the other guy. Um, oh good, I'm glad you're having your yeah. brain shut down too. I can like imagine his face, but not his name. And it doesn't matter actually. So. I think that for both of them, and they both received a very small margin of the vote, um, Isaac and Shanae. Mm -hmm. And they're both like coming from a fairly qualified, skilled activist background, right? Yes. Um, yep. So Shanae has worked for um, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, has done like a lot of really solid work in DC, is from Vermont. Um, Isaac similarly ran a national organization that did a lot of action, activist action in Congress, got some great mm -hmm. stuff moving and passed in Congress, is from here, was running from that. Um, and they both entered the race a little bit after the other candidates declared. Um, the candidates who had been working in Vermont for a long time. So right. um, Shanae Ans entered after Becca. Um, mm -hmm. Isaac entered. I mean, I don't know. I even know when Peter started his campaign. That seems sort of an irrelevant thing to say. Um, but around then, after that. Um, and I think it's really easy for both of them. And I have not heard either of them do this yet. I just, like, I know that this is sort of the narrative that I heard coming into it. That, mm -hmm. like money, you know, it's really hard to be in politics and without money. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's true. Mm -hmm. um, it's true in Vermont. I think it's more true in Vermont in the context of our state legislature where you need money to actually serve. Right. Rather than money yeah. to run. Yep. Um, and, and just to be clear, what you're talking about is the, the stipends that you all receive yes and the time you need to take off work and and those sorts of things um you need to have financial resources of some sort to be able to do it yes so while we're actually in session it pays sort of as much um the equivalent of like my mediocre nonprofit jobs mm -hmm. but when we're out of session i then need to scramble to find another job or somehow find a job that's okay with me not being at that job for six months or all those things and you know yeah. health insurance and benefits with part-time work and all those things so it's really like, it's, so that's sort of one context for needing money to run in Vermont, which is totally solid. These congressional races, you know, the folks who won spent like a million dollars, right? So I'm not saying there isn't like a lot of money in politics, mm -hmm. a lot of money needed to like run a really solid across the state campaign. But, and this is the but, 
Um, Becca said something at her campaign night event um, in her sort of celebration speech that her campaign was run on relationships, not connections. That her mm. campaign was won on relationships, not connections. Mm -hmm. um, and that really resonated for me about sort of what I, what I think a lot of the challenge with Isaac and Shanae's campaigns were and why I think that doesn't mean that someone else couldn't win from, you know, an, another underdog couldn't win in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I think to win a statewide campaign like that, you need to have a statewide network before you kick off or you need a million dollars. Right. So a million dollars can buy a statewide network. Mm -hmm. Probably mm -hmm. not a very effective one. And I think Molly yeah. Gray's campaign points to that. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, but you need to actually have relationships, I think, to do this well, to win in Vermont, particularly where people just ask their neighbors who to vote for. Mm -hmm. um, you need to have relationships. Relationships people, are the connections. Yes. In Vermont. All yeah. around the state. So you could have political connections or financial connections that like buy you that million dollars to hire people in every corner of the state. Mm -hmm. That's one way to run a really robust campaign in Vermont. Or you can have relationships with people all around the state. And those people will bring in their trusted relationships. And those trusted relationships will sort of create opportunities for you as a candidate to meet people all over the mm -hmm. state yeah. and have you be a real person to all those people all over the state. Mm -hmm. And neither Shanae nor Isaac went into their campaigns with those statewide relationships. So I think it's very possible that someone who knew for a long time they wanted to do this, who spent two years planning a campaign like this, mm -hmm. could have the kind of, or was even in a working position, you know, or a community organizing position where they were able to go around to all the corners of the state and form really lasting, powerful relationships based on, you know, shared values, um, mm -hmm. could absolutely run as sort of an underdog candidate and win. Right. But it's, it's those relationships that take a really long time. And I think, you know, people point to Zuckerman winning because of name recognition and because of Bernie's like very late in the game endorsement. Like, what was it? Like two days before the primary he did it? Um, I think so, but hasn't he endorsed him before? So it he wasn't... totally has. Yeah, no, it was not like, but, and like, you know, David has like a bajillion pictures of the two of them together going back to like 1973. But mm -hmm. um. David's also been doing this around the state for so long that he has relationships in every corner of the state yeah. with real people, you know? Um, yep. Like my doctor went to college with him, for instance. So like when I saw her at one of his events, I was like, what's happening? Like, you don't, you know, you don't usually come to this stuff. And she was like, oh no, he's been my friend from college. So just like, I think that's what it takes in this state. And I think that's something that's really underestimated in a lot of the coverage of some of these races and even the stories that candidates tell themselves. Yeah. Um, and so I think when we look at the, even our state Senate race. Mm -hmm. So the, we had- The one between Becca Ballin, uh, sorry, no, not no. Becca Ballin, uh, Wendy Harrison, Nader Hashim and Wichy R2. Yes. yes. So when okay. we look at that one, um, they all had actually fairly similar political values. They all talked mm -hmm. about them very, very differently. But I think at the end of the day, the three of them, having known all three of them fairly well at this point, like talking about politics with all three of them, I think all three of them would have voted the same like 99.9% of the time. Yeah. They might have slightly different um, strategies in the legislature, but actually all three of them are like sort of fairly sensible I, I have to admit, when I went to the polls, I felt a little spoiled for choice. Yes, absolutely. Like, yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of people felt that way. Um, <laughs> and both Wendy and Nader have had a much longer time in Wyndham County. Yeah. To have those relationships all around the county. Mm -hmm. They have both worked state, like they have both worked countywide in very deep ways, right? Yes. Um, and so, and I think that 
you know, Wendy was the town manager in town, like in a very wide ranging set of towns. Um, and uh, Rockingham, Vernon down in this area. And then she also yes. worked up in uh, North Western Vermont. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, she did a lot of transportation work in Wilmington as mm-hmm. a volunteer. That's right. Um, I forgot about that. But had like, you know, had the opportunity of like deep sustained relationships around mm-hmm. very similar issues um, where people could see what working with her looked like all mm-hmm. around the county. Um, and not or similarly, you know, as a cop and now as an attorney or as a person reading for the, I don't really know what his clerk is reading the law. Yeah. Reading the law as a person reading the law um, has also, and then as a legis, you know, as a state legislator, mm-hmm. I go to, you know, I have meetings with people in Wilmington, even though I'm just serving Brattleboro. Right. right. Um, and so had those opportunities for that, like really deep, um, those deeper reach and which he has had that just not for as long and sustained a period of time in our area. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went, I would argue that um, probably not as broad an area mm-hmm. either at this yeah. point in his, his career. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's, you know, in Vermont, people vote for people that they know for the most part. You know, I, I talked to um, a few voters after the election who said that they didn't know who to vote for. And then they met one of the candidates at the, at these events on the common and said like, I met them and I really liked them and we talked about stuff and it was great. And then I voted for them. Mm-hmm. And I was mm-hmm. like, Oh, good. The events worked. Who knew? That's awesome. Yeah. But also exactly. like, so like so classically Vermont that that's the expectation that we'll be able to meet every single candidate. The other thing that um, I heard a lot from people too is a lot of folks talk to me about the uh, Vermont public. I'm still not used to saying that debates and uh, how, how many people said, well, I really liked so-and-so and I was going to vote for them, but then I saw how they talked to other people. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like how they treated other people. So I decided to vote for someone else. And I was surprised to hear how many people would say that too. Like in a debate, you, you often, I think on the national stage, we kind of look for who's, who's got the bigger fists. Mm-hmm. And yet on the Vermont, it's like, oh, they weren't nice. <laughs> they, they lost their temper. They, um, they, they weren't they weren't team players. Yeah. Is what I heard. You know, there's like a lot of gender bias that can sneak and racial bias that can sneak into what it means to be nice Mm -hmm. and expectations of niceness. You know, I think we have a much higher expectation of niceness around women and people of color. This is Um, true. And It's we also still, have a very high expectation of niceness for our lawmakers. And I really think that do. has, I think that has gotten more so since the Trump administration. Yes. Um, yes. We don't want it to be like it is out there in here. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that is another big mm-hmm. love it or hate it. It is. It is something we expect of our lawmakers. Yeah. I personally wouldn't mind if lawmakers had a few more knockdown drag outs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I actually think our lawmakers need a few little knockdown drag outs mm-hmm. from time to time. Yeah, I um, r- r- just this summer, for some reason, I have gotten a lot of feedback um, from folks who like very, very casual feedback from folks who have testified in a committee I've been in over the last few years or um, watch testimony as a person who worked for an agency that was giving testimony, um, who gave me like just huge gratitude for asking difficult questions, Mm -hmm. um, which is like sort of very on brand for me um, Mm -hmm. in terms of like my political career, but also really validating because I have experienced a tremendous amount of pressure um, to not ask difficult questions that it's like not considered polite. Yes. I have gotten that in my career as well. Yeah. And that is just like, I'm like, that's actually why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's in fact, I thought why we were all here. 
was to like sift through the information and find the nuggets. Um, and granted, there's like absolutely a way to do that curiously and kindly rather than, but I don't think I've ever crossed the line into like an aggressive, you know, an aggressive I, mode. I wouldn't even say, um, I would say about, um, I think I would characterize it more as, um, I think we can ask uncomfortable questions and we can even do it sometimes somewhat aggressively. It's about respect. Yeah. Is, is what I think people come away with. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Huh. Yeah. I, I've done a few stories where people have come to me afterwards and they're like, Oh, I didn't like that. That was uncomfortable. And I say, yeah, but it was the truth. And they're like, didn't want to know it. Just straight up didn't want to know. I was like, would you rather have not known the truth? And they're like, yes. And I was like, okay. Go read Dilbert. <laughs> yes. That's what the funny sections is for. Um. I, we got a little off topic and I'm just checking time because I know you yeah. have a meeting. Um, one thing I was sitting with looking at the uh, Wyndham County Senate race, and this isn't the first time I've sat with this, is, you know, one thing I really respect about Weechee specifically is he comes from a very strong activist background. And, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of um, activist organizations in our county Mm -hmm. doing very good work but it gets me thinking about that what what skills do we have in different parts of our lives that either do or do not translate into creating policy mm -hmm. and um i i often hear from folks you know, when they talk about, well, I have this experience or that experience, and that makes me qualified to do, to do policy. Um, and this isn't aimed at any particular uh, candidate from, from the primary, but in, in U.S. politics specifically, that idea of the amateur being the, the holy grail. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, so, so how about you, you know, as you, as you were sitting and looking at some of the candidates or this election, past election, what do you feel about that thought of what people bring and what does or does not translate well as a skill set? And I, I know that's broad, but I'm trying to be vague because I don't want to say specifically yeah, yeah. like, oh, if you've been a select board, then automatically you can. Yeah, I think there's a few things. One, um, you know, I just want to say very explicitly. So Molly Gray ran near the end of her campaign on how appropriate her experience was for Congress. She talked about nearly half a decade of experience over and over again, which for the record is three years, nearly half a decade. Um, but she also sort of pointed Technically to like- Technically true, a, but not true, yes. Yes, she also <laughs> um, pointed to being an attorney and all these other things. Um, I think she would have had a more compelling message if she said, I am young and fresh and from the farm and all of these things. And I'm going to do these things differently because I haven't been you know, worn down by a decade of taking votes. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's a much more compelling message than trying to build up three years of experience into like the perfect resume. Right. Mm -hmm. And for me, that really, again, points to this idea that the best preparation for, I think, doing this work and doing this work well is knowing yourself and being comfortable with yourself. Mm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause then you'll know, you'll feel comfortable in this time of asking questions of sifting through information of, cause you're sitting from a solid core when you're doing the work. Okay. And I think that, um, I think that might be the most important skill. The other piece of preparation that I think is really the most important for being a good legislator is having taken a hard vote mm -hmm. and having people be unhappy with you. And so I think that can happen by serving on your co-op board, which is, you know, a place rife with conspiracy and um, complaints. 
Um, it can come from serving on your select board. It can come from supervising people through tough stuff. Um, it can come maybe even from, you know, it can come from parenting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think you need to have done something where a decision that you made, that you made alone, and that you have to hold and own made other people unhappy or uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that you have learned whatever you need to learn about yourself through that process. Because mm. I don't want anyone learning that stuff for the first time while they are voting on the Build Back Better Act or like right. whatever it is, you know, like I, I think there's a certain amount of sort of self-realization that has to happen before you um, move into certain spheres of power. That is a very good, thank you for that insight. Welcome. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought of that. So, so yes, um, the ability to, to stand even when folks are unhappy with you. Um, I am looking forward to the national, the, the November election mm -hmm. and seeing how all this shakes out for, for us. What and I, I know what I'll be doing to, to, to make, to prepare myself to make decisions. What are you hoping people will consider as they consider the candidates for November? I think four years ago, two years ago, I think four years ago, we were not aware of what it took to of what um, wild times we would be living through. And I think two years ago, we were so terrified by the wild times we were living through that all we wanted was stability and like, mm -hmm. you know, a strong father figure. Um, I, I think I at least, um, and I hope other people have sort of come to terms with the reality that like, we never know what's gonna happen next in this life. Um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, was true four years ago, just as much, much as it's true now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to be thinking a lot about candidates' ability to be nimble. Yes. To fight for what's right, to let go of what doesn't matter, to mm -hmm. really like ride the waves of history with me in a way that I can trust. Um, mm -hmm. And I know I'll be looking out for the best needs of my community. And so that, that for me is what I'm going to be looking at in the selection cycle. Mm -hmm. I, I would have said a little differently. I would have said candidates' ability to be creative, creative and pivot um, based on, on what new information they may have. Because um, I, I still have that hope that you and I started talking about when COVID hit of now that we can see some of the cracks, how are we going to respond in new ways? Mm -hmm. And and I still have that hope that people will keep seeing the cracks and responding in new ways. And, and so that's, that's what I hope people will evaluate candidates by mm -hmm. as, as we go into November. Me too. Yes. And to give you a little bit of hope, Olga, I've been to three different legislative, three different conferences in the last month. Um, two of them national and then one of them in Vermont yesterday. And in all three places I've attended panels that were essentially like, what have we learned from COVID that we want to carry into the future? So thank you. That does, we're not the hope. only ones having the conversation, just the two of us. Oh, good. <laughs> Even though it feels like that some days. <laughs> well, on that note, we have come to the end of this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour on WBEW, 107.7 uh, LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. Hey, Emily, where can folks find more information about you and I'm good, it's a two part question. And what, where do you think people can find good information on candidates going forward? So folks can go to emilykornheiser.org to find links to all of the things and more information about me and what I'm doing. Um, I think to learn, Dig, Vermont Digger has like a voter sort of uh, a candidate database thing that has a lot of good links in it. Yeah. 
It's in the candidate's own words, but it's a great place to sort of start. Um, Mm -hmm. Most of like your standard activist organizations also are rolling out endorsements. Mm -hmm. Um, I, they mean something. There's like a lot of backroom politics involved in them. I don't know if I would put too much stock in them. Excuse me, all of those organizations who might hear me say this. Um, And you know, you can call any candidate and just say like, hey, do you have a few minutes to talk? And they will Mm -hmm. all make time for that with you. Yes, I actually, I think that's the best advice. Mm -hmm. And listeners, we don't really have plans until November, I don't think very much on this show. So if like you have a thing you want us to do, please reach out and let us know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, we're we're still deciding how we want to go forward with, Mm -hmm. yeah, that time between here and November. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're like just going to be like prepping for the general election unless you all tell us a way you want that done. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And you can tell it either through our Facebook page, the Montpelier Happy Hour, or uh, the Montpelier Happy Hour at gmail.com is our um, email. And Emily, where can folks find more information on you? EmilyKornheiser.org. Perfect. You can also find us on BCTV, wherever you find your podcasts and our Captivate page. So until next week, everybody, take care. <laughs>